House at World's End by Stephen Sheridan. I say, Lincoln, budge up. There's a good fellow. You're late. I know. I was trying to finish an essay and lost track of the time. Shh. Oh, for heaven's sake, Dawlish. Sit down and stop making a spectacle of yourself. This is King's College Chapel, not the stage of a London music hall. I thought that was never going to finish. My feet are like two blocks of ice. You must be the most ill-mannered student in Cambridge, Dawlish. First, you turn up halfway through the Christmas Eve carol service. Then you have the impudence to complain that it wasn't short enough. I'm not saying that I didn't enjoy it. I just wish I'd remember to wear thicker socks. Excuse me, gentlemen. May I have a word? Oh, Lord, it's the provost. What does he want? Don't look so worried, Mr. Dawlish. I'm not going to scold you for getting to chapel so late. And thank you, Dr. James. I would, however, like to know why you and Mr. Lincoln are still in college so long after the end of term. We'd rather be at home with our families, sir, but they're currently in India, serving the Raj. I'm extremely sorry to hear it, gentlemen. I trust that remaining at King's isn't proving too disagreeable an alternative. Far from it, sir. We've been able to observe some of its celebrated Christmas traditions. The college certainly isn't lacking in those, Mr Lincoln. There is, however, one tradition with which you may not be familiar. Indeed, sir. Every Christmas, it's my custom to read a ghost story of my own composition to a party of my friends. Everyone knows that, Dr. James. Your Christmas ghost stories have made you a household name. I'd prefer to think that I owed my reputation to my works of scholarship, Mr. Dawlish, but that's beside the point. If you don't have any prior engagements, you're both more than welcome to attend this evening's gathering. Oh, thank you, Dr. James. We'd be honoured. That's settled, then. We usually assemble in my rooms at a little after eight. Uh, don't worry, sir. We'll be there. Not a word of criticism for disrupting the carol service. I'd say you escaped pretty lightly, Dawlish. That's a matter of opinion. I was hoping to get on with my essay this evening. I'm sure a few hours away from your books won't do you any harm. After all, it is Christmas. And anyway, only a fool would pass up the chance to hear a new ghost story from the pen of M.R. James. <laughs> the entire college is shrouded in fog. Yeah, Come yeah. away from the window, Arthur. I want you to try this wine. Thank you. I picked it up on a cycling tour of the Low Countries. I think you'll find it agreeable. Who is it? Only us, sir. Good evening, gentlemen. I was starting to think you weren't coming. I know, sir. Dawlish lost track of the time again. Help yourselves to wine. I'm glad you could make it. Thank you, sir. I'm afraid, however, that... Like the rest of my guests, you've been lured here under false pretenses. Oh. And no doubt you're expecting to hear another of my tales of the uncanny, a sequel to Canon Alberic's scrapbook, perhaps, or The Treasure of Abbot Thomas. <laughs> That's why we're here, old boy. This year, I'm afraid I haven't bothered to write one. Oh, well, I must confess, Monty, I'm more than a little disappointed. Uh, there's no need to be Arthur... What I intend to offer you instead is far more substantial than a simple work of fiction. I'm not sure I follow. Do you recall what you said at the end of last year's story? Not exactly. No doubt I showered you with compliments. <laughs> you did, as a matter of fact. But then you asked me what had first awakened my interest in the supernatural. That's right. I remember now. Well, Arthur, tonight you shall have your answer. The story which I'm about to set before you is all the more remarkable for being entirely true. Good heavens, I see. It happened exactly 30 years ago, in the winter of 1882. At the time, I'd only recently arrived in Cambridge and was sharing rooms with a fellow undergraduate named... Well, we shall come to him in due course. Oh, splendid! Turn down the lamps, Mr Dawlish, and join us by the fire. I think the time has come to tell you exactly what happened to me all those years ago in the house at World's End. Like all the best ghost stories, mine began in the simplest and most straightforward manner. It was almost the end of Michaelmas term, and before I returned home to Suffolk, I decided to pay a visit to my favourite antiquarian bookshop. Good morning, Mr James. Morning, Jenkins. How's trade? Brisk, sir. Very brisk. I have here some new acquisitions which I, you may find of interest. Set them down, then. 
Let me examine them. This is a particularly rare edition of Jerusalem Delivered. Only a thousand copies were ever printed. Oh, I see. This commentary on Job is almost as hard to find. And look at this book of ours, sir. It dates from the 15th century. Since early childhood, books had always afforded me the keenest pleasure. Oh, yes. Exquisite. <laughs> Simply exquisite. The binding, the printing, the smell of the ink. Each of these elements filled me with joy. Hello, Monty. I was so absorbed in studying Mr Jenkins' treasures that I entirely failed to notice my roommate come in. I had a feeling I'd find you in here. Henry Gilbert was an agreeable enough young man. His natural environment, however, was the rugby field and the cricket pitch. His unexpected arrival in a bookshop immediately aroused my suspicions. Hello, Henry. What do you want? What makes you think I want anything? Why else would you be here? You hate these kinds of places. Well, I'm deeply wounded, old fellow. Surely I can greet a friend without having an ulterior motive. If you say so, Henry. I do, however, have a small favour to ask. Ah, I see. Have you ever heard me mention my Uncle Magnus? Once or twice. He lives in Cornwall, I believe. That's right. All on his own. I usually go down there and keep him company at this time of year. That's very charitable of you. <laughs> Not really. He's by far the richest member of my family, and I'm his only heir. I'm, I'm sorry, Henry, but I, I fail to see how any of this concerns me. Well, Uncle Magnus isn't a bad sort in his way, but he he's hardly the most sociable of men. I thought I might be a little less lonely if I went down with a friend. Just a minute. Am I to understand that you want me to come with you? Well done, Monty. Got it in one. <laughs> I'm extremely flattered, of course. But wouldn't you rather take a member of the college cricket team? Well, certainly not. We've been sharing rooms for eight weeks, yet we barely know each other. This will be the perfect opportunity to get better acquainted. I suppose that's true. Anyway, none of the cricket team could make it. Oh, really, Henry? <laughs> I'm only joking. Oh, please, Monty. Say you'll come. Well, my parents will be very disappointed if I miss Christmas. Oh, I see. On the other hand, relations with father have been a little strained of late. That's settled, then. We'll leave as soon as term's ended. Henry, just a minute. I can't stop. I've got rugby practice. No, but Henry... Thank you, Monty. You're a true friend. <sighs> my, my. What an extremely forceful young man. That's one way of describing him. Uh, would you care to examine any more volumes, Mr James? Oh, no, thank you, Jenkins. Uh, I'd better get back to college and start packing. Mm -hmm. It seems I'll be spending Christmas in Cornwall this year. It was perfectly true that my relationship with my father had deteriorated of late. There was, however, another reason why I was far from reluctant to accompany Henry to Cornwall. Does your uncle still maintain his library? I'm sorry? He once told me that he was a passionate book collector. Yeah, it's more of a mania than a passion. But don't worry, Monty. I give you my word. You won't be short of things to read. Cranley Hall, the home of Henry's uncle, was in the aptly named village of World's End. The nearest railway station was more than ten miles away, and we were obliged to complete the final stage of our journey in an open carriage. Cheer up, Monty. We'll soon be there. Good. I'm chilled to the bone. <laughs> you want to take more exercise? Dip in the cam each morning and soon improve your circulation. The Romans, when they first arrived on these shores, described England as a land of mists and phantoms. As we slowly drove through the dank and gloomy lanes of World's End, their description came to seem ever more apposite. Our carriage turned off into a large private driveway, and I was rewarded with my first glimpse of Cranley Hall. Well, Monty, what do you think? Rather magnificent, wouldn't you say? It was, in its way, a perfectly impressive country seat. As I struggled to make out its sombre towers through the encroaching twilight, I could fully understand why Henry should have been so reluctant to come here alone. The length of our journey had done nothing to diminish Henry's formidable energy. As soon as our carriage stopped outside the house, he leapt to the ground and, taking the front steps two at a time, vanished inside. Clutching my valise, I wearily followed behind. Hello? Mrs Turner? We're here. Henry's voice echoed around the dark and cavernous entrance hall. 
A door opened, and a woman I took to be the housekeeper emerged. Master Henry, is that you? Hello, Mrs. Turner. Oh, oh, I'm sure you're still growing, sir. You look taller than ever. <laughs> this is my friend from Cambridge. I said in my letter he'd be coming. I'm very pleased to meet you. Where's Uncle Magnus? Locked away in his study. Well, no, sir. He's upstairs in bed. At this hour? What's the matter with him? I think you'd better come and see for yourself. At Henry's insistence, I accompanied him to his uncle's bedroom. <sighs> the emaciated old man we discovered huddled up in bed was a truly pitiful spectacle. His skin, harshly illuminated by an oil lamp on the bedside table, was the colour of ancient parchment. A thin beard of dark grey stubble surrounded a mouth which appeared to be constantly moving in a kind of silent conversation. Uncle Magnus? It's Henry, Uncle Magnus. At first he seemed unaware of our presence, his gaze passing through us to some unimaginable vista that only he could see. Uncle Magnus! Finally, however, Henry's voice seemed to reach him and his eyes slowly focused on the source of the words. Henry? Why are you here? Why, it's Christmas, Uncle Magnus. I always come down at Christmas. You must forgive him, sir. His mind is apt to wander. Well, how long has he been like this? Over a week, sir. He only pecks at his food, and I'm sure he isn't sleeping properly. Well, I'm not surprised. There's too much light in this room. No! No! Don't touch the lamp! Oh, I should have warned you, sir. He insists on keeping that lamp burning all night long. Uh, there's someone with you. Who, who is he, Henry? What does he want? Good evening, sir. I'm Montague James. I share rooms with your nephew at Cambridge. Monty's a fellow book lover, Uncle Magnus. When you've recovered, you must show him round your library. I shan't recover. I, I don't deserve to recover. Nonsense. A few more days in bed and you'll be ready to open the batting for England. It's the waiting I find so hard to bear. Sometimes I wish it were all over. But, but, but when I think what that means... But it's all right, Uncle Magnus. I'm frightened, Henry. I'm so very frightened. The old man's distress was painful to witness, and I had resolved to withdraw when suddenly we were disturbed by the sound of someone knocking at the front door. Are you expecting any visitors? Oh, that'll be Dr. De Lacy, sir. No! He often looks in no. at this time. No, I won't see him. But, Uncle... Please, Henry, send him away. I won't have De Lacy inside my house. Gently but firmly, Henry insisted that his uncle must see the doctor. And at length, the old man acquiesced. I went to my room to unpack... And when I came downstairs, I discovered Henry talking to Mrs. Turner. Have you any idea what caused my uncle's illness? Oh, I only wish I had, sir. He took to his bed shortly after poor Mr. Paget died. Mr. Paget? The sexton at St. Anne, sir. I've never heard of him. Were he and Uncle Magnus good friends? Not that I know of, sir. Your uncle is hardly a regular churchgoer. Hmm. Oh, I'd better speak to Dr. De Lacy before he leaves. Ask him to wait for me in the library, Mrs. Turner. Very good, sir. Oh, I'm sorry I asked you here, Monty. This isn't proving much of a holiday, I'm afraid. Oh, don't apologise, Henry. You're not to blame. I simply can't understand it. Uncle Magnus has always been so strong and courageous. What can have turned him into such a frightened little child? He seems to have regained some of his former vigour. When I passed his door, I heard him shouting at the doctor. <laughs> well, that's another mystery. Why has he suddenly turned against De Lacey? Well, we're all apt to blame our physicians when we're unwell. Oh, but they've always been so close. They used to spend their evenings together poring over dusty old manuscripts. I'm oh, sorry, Henry. I don't have any better explanation. No, of course not. Forgive me. Let's go to the library and see if Dr De Lacey can enlighten us. Magnus Gilbert's library was even more impressive than I'd anticipated. The walls groaned under the weight of several thousand rare volumes, and I was seized by an almost irresistible urge to start examining them. My enthusiasm, it seemed, was shared by another. A tall, frock-coated figure I took to be Magnus's friend and physician was also scanning the shelves. Good evening, Dr. De Lacy. Good evening, Henry. I've just been admiring your uncle's collection. 
So I observe. Do you know if these are his latest acquisitions? I don't know and I don't care. I didn't ask you here to talk about books. There's no need to forget your manners, Henry. Behaving like a savage won't improve the situation. Forgive me, but I'm extremely concerned about my uncle. Have you any idea what's wrong with him? If you want me to name some disease or other, I'm afraid I can't. Your uncle's had a good life, but now, at the last, he's starting to fail. Well, that's hardly an adequate explanation. I hope you're not questioning my judgment, Henry. <sighs> of course not. But why does he seem so frightened? You can hardly expect a man under sentence of death to be in high spirits. Is there no hope, then? And you are, sir? A friend of Henry's. Ah. Montague James. It's difficult to be optimistic, I'm afraid. Magnus seems weaker every time I visit. Well, surely there must be something we can do. A change of environment might prove beneficial. I hardly think Uncle Magnus is in a fit state to travel. Alternatively, I could move into the house for a few days. I beg your pardon? I can't promise a cure, but were his condition suddenly to deteriorate, I would at least be on hand. It's, it's a generous offer, Dr. De Lacy, but I couldn't possibly accept. I see. Well, I, I know you've been friends for years, but your, um, your presence seems to disturb him. In that case, all we can do is wait and pray. Uncle Magnus has never really believed in the power of prayer, I'm afraid. You might be surprised at what he's come to believe, Henry. I'm sorry? It's a dark and dangerous world, my boy. Sometimes it can turn even the most sceptical of us into believers. Henry was an active man, and after dinner, he suggested that we went outside to take in the night air and smoke our cigars. Wrapped up in our greatcoats, we slowly walked through the avenues of oak trees that surrounded Cranley Hall. Has your uncle always lived in this house? Mm. More or less. He bought it over 50 years ago. When was it built? I haven't a clue. Dr. De Lacy is the man to ask. Oh? He's an enthusiastic local historian. Hmm. I'm not sure I care for Dr. De Lacy. Oh, I don't think he finds his work very fulfilling. Clever, dissatisfied men are apt to grow bitter. But that's a very astute observation. Thank you, Monty. I may prefer the playing field to the library, but I'm not entirely devoid of intelligence. Forgive me, I didn't mean to imply... Monty! That... Look, What's the matter? Look, look, look. Um, quickly, over, over by the house. I can't see anything. There it is again. I'm sorry, Henry, but it's too dark. Look on there. I'm sure I saw something move. What was it? Some sort of wild animal? Well, it wasn't like any animal I've ever seen. It's horribly twisted and bent, but for all its deformity, I, I'd swear it was a man. We fetched a couple of lanterns and made an extensive search of the grounds. When we failed to uncover any sign of an intruder, Henry finally conceded that he must have been mistaken. Oh, moonlight can play strange tricks on the imagination, and I'm more than a little on edge. Oh, don't worry, Henry. I'm sure you'll feel better after a good night's sleep. Wearily, we returned to the house and made our way upstairs. As we trudged past Magnus's bedroom, I was surprised to notice that there was no longer any light seeping out from under the door. Clearly, he must have extinguished his lamp. I thought Mrs. Turner said that he kept it burning all night. Perhaps he feels safer knowing that we're in the house. Best not to disturb him. I agree. Now, I, um, I know I've made one or two jokes about inheriting my uncle's money, but you do think he'll be all right, don't you? If he has a tenth of your iron constitution, I'm sure he'll live for another twenty years. <laughs> you're a good friend, Monty. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad, too. Good night, Henry. Good night. Alas, my night was anything but good. Perhaps because of my unfamiliar surroundings, I was troubled by strange dreams. Repeatedly, I found myself in a densely wooded copse, running as though pursued by the very hounds of hell. No matter how far I ran, however, my terror did not seem to abate. <laughs> At first, I thought the dreadful scream I heard was part of my dream. When it came a second time, though, I realised that it was emanating from inside the house. I traced the source of the screams to Magnus's bedroom. Inside, I discovered Henry comforting Mrs Turner. It's all right. It's all right. I 
just came to look in on him, sir, and, and that's when I found him. Magnus was sprawled out on the carpet. He was quite dead. His passing had clearly been far from peaceful. His sightless eyes gazed upwards in abject terror, and his mouth was fixed open in a soundless cry. You'd better take Mrs Turner downstairs, Monty. Come along, Mrs Turner. You'll feel better after a strong cup of tea. His oil lamp lay smashed to pieces, as though he had hurled it against the wall. Unaccountably, he appeared to have opened the window before he collapsed. There was also something less tangible in the room that struck me as odd. Despite the open window, the air was heavy with the sickly sweet odour of rotting flesh. You're sure you won't join me in a drink? No, thank you, Henry. It's a little too early. I've, um, I've never seen a dead body before. I'm afraid it's rather unsettled me. That's only to be expected. It's, it's his expression I can't get out of my mind. He, he looked as though he'd been frightened to death. Ah, I've finished my examination. It's just as I suspected. Heart failure. Heart failure? Oh, come along, Dr. De Lacy. Surely there must be more to it than that. Oh, forgive me, Henry. I hadn't realised you were a student of medicine. I'm not. Then you are hardly qualified to comment, are you? Well, what about his face? Why was it so contorted? Facial spasm is not uncommon in cases of cardiac arrest. And his bedroom window? Why had he opened that in the middle of the night? Perhaps he was short of breath and wanted some air. How should I know? You really are a most tiresome young man. I was surprised to see Dr. De Lacy lose his temper. At the time, however, I attributed his lack of composure to the death of his friend. I'm sure Henry didn't mean any offence, Dr. De Lacy. But he has just lost his uncle. You mustn't allow emotion to cloud your judgment, Henry. If, however, you'd rather be left to mourn in peace, I'll be on my way. Thank you, Dr. De Lacy. I do, though, have a small favour to ask before I leave. There's a book in your uncle's collection... De Regni Umbrorum. The Kingdom of Shadows. Quite so. What about it? Magnus was most insistent that in the event of his death it should be given to me. Well, I, I, I'm sorry, Dr. De Lacy. Until I find his will, I can't even think about disposing of his property. Oh, come along, Henry. Surely you can make an exception. My friend has given you his answer. You'll just have to wait. And now, if you'll excuse us, we have a great deal to do. After Dr. De Lacy left, we repaired to the library. Henry was anxious to locate his uncle's will and instigated a search. Whilst he was rifling through cupboards and opening drawers, I availed myself of the chance to examine some of the books. Your uncle must have spent a lifetime assembling this collection. I don't know what you see in them, Monty. I really don't. This drawer's locked. Hand me that paper knife. You don't intend to force it. That's a Louis XIV's writing desk. It's just a lump of old wood. Don't make such a fuss. Oh, really, Henry? The sooner I can start getting my uncle's affairs in order, the happier I'll be. Oh, dear. Got it. Is your uncle's will inside? No, don't think so. What was the book Dr. De Lacy wanted? De Regni Umbrorum. I wonder why Uncle Magnus locked it in here. May I look at it? Help yourself. Oh, don't throw books around like that. They're not rugby balls. Well, what do you think? Well, it's very old. 16th century, I'd say. Mm -hmm. It's partly in Latin, partly in Aramaic. I don't even know what language these passages use. Is it worth anything? Oh, to a scholar of ancient tongues, it's priceless. And to the rest of us, what would it fetch at auction? You're such a philistine, Henry. Go back to your search and leave the book to someone who appreciates it. Well, I, I was only asking... It's well... like an elegant puzzle. But I'll find the key. The text has yet to be written that I can't translate. My youthful self-confidence proved misplaced. Although I studied the Kingdom of Shadows all through the evening and long into the night, it failed to yield up its meaning. Finally, at one o'clock in the morning, I blew out my candle and retired to bed. I only slept fitfully, however. A powerful wind blew up, and the branches of an oak tree outside my window scratched noisily at the glass. 
And then, at a little after three... Monty? M Monty! Oh. Henry? <sighs> it's the middle of the night. Yeah, I, I, I know. Look, I, I was having trouble sleeping, so I... I went to fetch myself a brandy. And, and as I walked past the library, I... Yes? Well, it, it may have been my imagination, but I'm sure I heard noises. Noises? I, I'm not usually a nervous man, but after everything that's happened... Well, it, it's all right, Henry. I, I quite understand. We'll go down together and see what's afoot. We crept down to the library and listened outside. I can't hear anything. Shh. Finally, we plucked up our courage and opened the door. There was no intruder to be found inside. What we discovered instead, however, was almost as bad. My God, Monty. The French windows were open and papers blew around us like autumn leaves. Books had been plucked from their shelves and hurled to the floor. The entire library appeared to have been subjected to a feverish search. When I came down the following morning, I found Henry gazing gloomily through the drawing room window. Although I had seen him only a few hours previously, he appeared to have aged by a good five years. Henry, about last night... I don't wish to discuss it. Uh, but, Henry, would you listen There's to... something very strange going on in this house. Something very strange and terrible. You mustn't give way to childish superstition. There's a perfectly rational explanation for what we saw in the library. Oh? We both know how windy it was last night. A sudden gust must have blown open the French windows and scattered the books. That's impossible. It wasn't strong enough. Your bedroom doesn't face east. It was blowing the branches of an oak tree against my window all night. What are you talking about? I heard them scratching against the glass. Well, you can't have. What do you mean? See for yourself, Monty. See for yourself. The nearest oak tree is more than 50 yards from your room. Two days later, Magnus was laid to rest in the World's End churchyard. Henry listened to the service without emotion. He had become increasingly listless and morose during the previous 48 hours and was, I'm sure, drinking heavily. This is a sad day, gentlemen. As we left the churchyard, we were accosted by the only other mourner. Magnus and I had our differences, but he was a good friend. Thank you for coming, Doctor. That book I mentioned. Have you found it? Oh, really? This is neither the time nor the place. But it's important. Come along, Henry. Shall we go home? I must have it. Do you hear me, Henry? I must. Henry had discovered his uncle's will, and he spent the evening examining its clauses and provisions. Normally the most voluble of men, he scarcely spoke a word until, at length, I broke the silence. Have you decided what you'll do with Cranley Hall? Not, sir. I was just wondering if you intended to keep it. Certainly not. I've come to hate every last inch of the place. And your uncle's collection? Now the Fitzwilliam can have it for all I care. It belongs in a museum. Oh, forgive me, sir. Oh, really, Mrs Turner, when will you learn to knock? I'm sorry, sir, but I assumed you must be in the library. What? What's the oddest thing, sir? When I went past, I'm sure I heard someone inside. Henry and I exchanged glances and immediately ran to the library. This time we didn't stand cowering outside, but immediately burst through the door. We half expected to find some supernatural agency at work in the room. Instead, we discovered something just as surprising. The French windows had been forced open and Dr. De Lacy was pulling books from the shelves. He briefly examined each title before hurling it to the floor. Where is it? Are you looking for this? Oh, give it to me! As soon as he saw the Kingdom of Shadows, he lunged towards me. I quickly returned it to my pocket whilst Henry held him back. For heaven's sake, man, come to pose yourself! I must have that book! Evidently. But is it really worth twice breaking the law? Twice? What are you talking about? Oh, come along, Dr. De Lacy. We all know you broke in here the other night. Oh, my God. He's been here already. Who has? I give you my word, gentlemen. 
This is the first time I've forced my way into Cranley Hall. <laughs> a likely story. We're all in danger. Surely you must see that. Only the book can save us. I think it's time you furnished us with a proper explanation. And if I do, you'll let me have the book. Possibly. Very well, then. I'll tell you what I know. By the time I've finished, however, you may wish you hadn't asked. We returned to the drawing room, where Henry poured himself another drink. Dr. De Lacy struggled to compose himself, and at last, when he was calmer, he started to speak. I don't suppose you've ever heard of William Addis? Should we have? Not really. He owned this house over 200 years ago. According to contemporary records, a, a childhood illness rendered him deformed and terrible to look upon. Shunned by his neighbours, he became a recluse, only venturing out during the hours of darkness. How dreadful. How did Addis occupy his time? In a manner hardly likely to enhance his reputation. He became a student of the occult, assembling quite a library on the subject. Needless to say, you have the most important volume tucked inside your pocket. The Kingdom of Shadows. It's a book with a long and bloody history. Its author claimed that hidden within its pages was the secret of summoning the devil. <laughs> what nonsense. The Inquisition didn't think so. They burned him at the stake, and only one copy of his work survived. How do you know all this? Oh, my practice isn't very demanding. I like to study local history in my spare time. I came across the details whilst I was going through Addis's papers. Uncle Magnus must have been fascinated. He became obsessed. He was determined to add the Kingdom of Shadows to his collection. He thought that owning the only copy of such an infamous book would be the crowning achievement of his career. How did he know where to find it? Well, that was easy. Addis had left instructions that when he died, it was to be buried with him in the family vault. Just a minute. Sh Surely you, do you don't mean... <laughs> Grave robbing is a dreadful business, Henry. But neither I nor your uncle were much troubled by religious convictions. We bribed Mr. Paget, the sexton at St. Anne's, to unseal the vault and set to work. Weren't you afraid? Not at first. When we opened the coffin, however, our blood ran cold. We'd expected to find nothing but dust, but instead... Yes? William Addis was still decomposing. There was flesh on his bones, gentlemen. Tattered, maggot-ridden flesh that smelt of decay. Yeah, and, and the book? And Addis still had it, clutched to his chest. Even in death, he was reluctant to give it up. I'm afraid we had to break several of his fingers. Horrible. How could you have done such a terrible oh, thing? Oh, don't worry, my stern young moralist. We were all to be punished, and Magnus was the first. What happened? He started hearing a voice calling to him in the still of the night. When he opened the curtains, there was no one outside. But as soon as he closed them again, the voice carried on. Well, how long did this continue? Every night for a week. By the end, Magnus had been reduced to a state of gibbering terror. And then Mr. Paget, the sexton, died. We've heard about that. He was found at the foot of his stairs with a broken neck. At the time, I thought it was an accident. I've become convinced, however, that someone pushed him. Someone or something. The ghost of William Addis. Magnus certainly thought so. He took to his bed and refused to get up. Weren't you frightened as well? I struggled to maintain my composure. I like to think that no one suspected the agonies I was suffering. But I, too, had started hearing a voice calling to me in the still of the night. My God! I... I tried to persuade Magnus that we must return the book to Addis's coffin. But his mind was gone, and he, he blamed me for his misfortunes. No matter how much I pleaded with him, he, he refused to tell me where it was hidden. Poor Uncle Magnus. <laughs> he paid the price for his intransigence. 
But it's not too late for me. It's the book I just wants. That's why he came searching the other night. Well, why didn't you tell us this sooner? Do you really think I'd have been believed? What makes you think we believe you now? What do you mean? You tell a good story, I'll grant you that. But I, for one, don't believe a word of it. You ignorant young whelp! You don't know what you're saying. If the Kingdom of Shadows is as rare as you claim, its value must be beyond calculation. No doubt you hope to frighten us into giving it to you. Henry, I beg of you, make him see sense. My friend has suffered enough. I won't allow you to bother him further. But don't you understand? You're, you're playing games with my life. We said we'd hear you out, and that's what we've done. I'm sorry, Dr. De Lacey, but I'd like you to leave. I escorted Dr. De Lacey to the front door. He realised that I didn't intend to yield and reluctantly disappeared into the night. When I emerged the following morning, I expected to discover that Henry's mental faculties had deteriorated still further. To my surprise, however, his spirits seemed to have rallied during the night, and he was sitting down to a hearty breakfast. Ah, good morning, Monty. Come and try the kedgeree. It's first rate. Well, I'm glad to see you eating again. <laughs> Everything seems worse when it's dark. I've decided you were quite right about Dr. De Lacey and his story. Well, that's excellent news. I do, though, have a favour to ask. This place is depressing me. Would you mind very much if we left? I think that's a capital idea. Why don't we spend Christmas at my house in Suffolk? A change of environment will do you the world of good. Excuse oh. me, sir. Yes, Mrs. Turner. I'm sorry to disturb you, but I think something must have happened. What are you talking about? A policeman's just arrived, sir, and he's asking for you. Henry Gilbert? Uh, yes, yes. I'm sorry to trouble you, sir, but I believe you were visited by Dr Richard de Lacey yesterday evening. Th th that's right. Yes, he left just after midnight. I'm afraid I have some rather bad news, sir. Dr de Lacey was found dead this morning at the top of your drive. Oh, my God. It's a curious business, sir. He'd lost a shoe and hadn't bothered going back for it which suggests he must have been running. Running? Yes, sir. That would certainly be consistent with the cause of death. We can't be absolutely sure, of course. But there's every indication that he ruptured his heart. It was William Addis. He must have been running from William Addis. This doesn't change anything. We're still going to spend Christmas at my house. Why didn't we listen to De Lacey? Everything he told us was true. <sighs> As the police haven't finished their investigation, we'll need permission to leave. I'm going to plead our case to the Chief Constable in St Ives. Please, Monty, don't leave me here on my own. I shan't be gone long. You can spend the morning packing. But, but, but Monty... A few more hours, Henry. Try to stay calm for a few more hours. By this time tomorrow, we'll both be in Suffolk. It was only with the utmost reluctance that I left Henry on his own. Proceedings at St Ives dragged on interminably, and by the time the Chief Constable granted us permission to leave, it was already dark. Henry! Henry! Arriving back at Cranley Hall just before midnight, I called for my friend. Oh, Mr James, it's you. Hello, Mrs Turner. Where's Henry? Oh, you just missed him, sir. He's gone out. Gone out? He didn't seem himself at all, I'm afraid. But he did leave you this letter. I took Henry's letter to the library to read. Monty, I have experienced more terror in the past few hours than most men will know in a lifetime. Wherever I go, I hear Addis calling me. My feelings of dread are now so profound that I can no longer bear them. Oh, Henry, what have you done? I opened the drawer in which I'd hidden the Kingdom of Shadows. It was just as I'd feared. Henry had taken it. Dr. De Lacey was right. Only the book will satisfy Addis. I have decided, therefore, to set out at once for his family vault. Henry, you fool. My actions, no doubt, will horrify you. But don't be alarmed. I know that what I'm doing will be for the best. With only the light of the moon to guide me, I set off after my troubled friend. I had no doubt that he would take the quickest route to the churchyard. Unfortunately, this involved crossing the densely wooded copse which separated it from Cranley Hall. Henry! Henry! As I stumbled through the trees, I was suddenly seized by a terrible realization. I had been here before. 
This was the copse through which I had been pursued a few nights previously in my dreams. Henry! Where are you? Struggling to choke down my panic, I carried on running. During the preceding days, I had scoffed at the very idea of supernatural powers. Now I felt them all around me, icy and dreadful, as real as the branches that whipped at my face. I ran in the direction of my friend's screams until, at last, I found him, slumped against a tree. Oh, oh, God's name, Henry! Whatever's happened? The eyes he turned upon me were devoid of reason. He... he, he came for me. I, I knew he would. He, he, he came for me. Precisely who or what Henry encountered, none of us will ever know. There are, however, two facts of which I'm certain. The Kingdom of Shadows had vanished without trace, and the cold night air was heavily laden with the scent of rotting flesh. Oh, a remarkable story, Monty. Quite remarkable. But tell me, what became of poor Henry Gilbert? He never regained his reason, I'm afraid. His mind was permanently broken by what happened that night. And you were finally convinced of the existence of ghosts? I learned two things at World's End, Mr Lincoln. One is that we live on an infinitely strange and mysterious planet. And the other, Dr James? The other, Mr Dawlish is that we must all be very careful how we acquire our second-hand books. <laughs> <laughs> Two glasses of mulled wine, if you please. Very good, sir. Why on earth did you want to meet me here? I finally finished my essay. Where better to celebrate than the finest alehouse in Cambridge? Oh, I can think of a dozen places. I'm sorry I spent so much of Christmas toiling away at my desk. I wanted to ask your opinion of the provost's story. It was quite unsettling in its way, and total fiction from start to end. Dr. James said it all really happened. Sometimes I pity you, Dawlish. Authors always say that. Your wine, gentlemen. It's one of the oldest <laughs> tricks in the book. Story. <laughs> What's that? A pint of ale, sir. That's all I ask. Buy me a pint and I'll tell you a story. Here. I thought I told you to leave ten minutes ago. I'm not doing any harm. I'll be the judge of that. It's time you went home. All right, all right, I'm going. I only wanted to tell them a story. I'm sorry about that, gentlemen. He's perfectly harmless. Just a bit touched in the head. <laughs> That's all right. There's no need to apologise. You wouldn't think he was once a student of the university, would you? What? He was at King, sir. Nearly 30 years ago. You wouldn't happen to know his name by any chance? Yes, sir. Henry Gilbert. No, you'll have to excuse me. I have people to serve. In The House at World's End by Stephen Sheridan, John Rowe was M.R. James, Jonathan Keeble, James as a young man, Charles Simpson, Henry Gilbert, David Collings, Dr. De Lacey, John Evitz, the bookseller and Uncle Magnus, Jean Trent, Mrs. Turner, James Durant, Dawlish, Alex Hutchinson, Lincoln, and Trevor Nichols, the barman. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The House at World's End was a peer production for BBC Radio 4, directed by David Blount.